I want to talk to you a little bit today about um, something that I'm inspired by and people that I'm inspired by and show you how it fits into kind of more mainstream engineering work. So uh, who I want to talk to you about are Ray and Charles Eames. So Ray and Charles Eames, uh, Charles was an architect and Ray was an artist. And they were really active in the US, kind of from the 30s and 40s, right up to the 80s when Charles died and the 90s uh, when Ray died. Um, and I find them hugely inspirational and have kind of fed into the kind of way we try and go about things where I work. So that's what I want to talk to you a little bit, bit about. So um, I don't know whether many people here have heard of Ray and Charles Eames. Yes. So a few people have, but mostly when people have heard of them, they've heard of them in, in the context of their chairs. They're very, very famous designers, and I bet you most people, even if you don't know the na name Eames, you will have come across an Eames chair. They've made the most beautiful, amazing objects, um, very, very modern, very gorgeous. Um, and these are just two of the chairs here. Uh, and a lot of people know them through that. But what I'm really, really interested in is their creative practices, um, their educational ideas, and the kind of the films that they made. So it's probably not known to very many people, but Ray and Charles Eames um, gave the first ever multimedia lecture in the world in 1953. And I think this is pretty astounding. So um, Charles was asked to go to uh, the University of Georgia in Athens to kind of rethink the art course there. Um, so what he did with a group of other people, he came up with kind of a sample way of lecturing instead, and it's called Rough Sketch of a Sample Lesson for a Hypothetical Course, or Artex, which is kind of a, a snappier term for it. Um, and in 1952, um, they gave these sample lessons, first of all in uh, Athens, Georgia, and then in UCLA. And they were just the most really amazing, truly multimedia experiences. So uh, the audience, they were sitting, these are black and white pictures so you don't get the full effect of it. The audience were sitting surrounded by beautifully designed images. They had sound, they had film. Smells were piped into the auditorium. Each of the chairs in the auditorium actually had vibrational things on them. So it was a completely immersive experience. Um, totally unheard of at the time and a really kind of radically different way of doing things. And as I said, this was 1952. Um, one of the really kind of, I suppose, things that, that I find kind of very attractive about the way they thought about things is they had this kind of fundamental belief in kind of information overload. And it's very, very different to how we understand education today. A lot of what we do today and the way we teach is about like reducing something to the bare minimum, sterilizing it, you know, dealing with the question, will that be on the exam? That kind of way of thinking, okay? And what they thought was, okay, what we want to do is we want to immerse people in lots of different ideas. We want to kind of bring them together. And we want people to make their own connections. And if you think this is exactly what Anne asked us to do at the beginning of this um, at this uh, Inspire Fest. She said, okay, you'll be sitting and you'll be listening to things and you won't be sure why they're connected to each other, but just give it a go. And I think that's what I think is so fantastic about this event. To me, it's actually already copying the kind of Eames principles that I, I, I think are very, very interesting. Anyway, the thing that I loved that came out of this was a film called A Communications Primer. And A Communications Primer, as you might guess from the name, uh, was a film that they created which was all about modern communications technology. And, and I'm an engineer and a telecommunications engineer, so I was hugely attracted to this film, which they made in 1953. And the reason why they made it is that both Ray and Charles Eames decided that it was really important that architects and designers and other people were really, really familiar with kind of what was happening kind of in the modern world of technology. And the most important thing for me in this, and the most important thing about them, and I would describe it, is they were fearless. So what they did, is, as artists and architects who had no background in technology, they accessed the most, I suppose, cutting edge technology of the day. So in 1949, Claude Shannon had made a very, very famous paper in Bell Labs, uh, and that paper, from that paper stemmed the kind of digital world that we currently live in. So they, they accessed that, they understood it, they processed it. And this is a, a, a diagram from the Claude Shannon paper that shows communication systems and how noise is added and how, how, how noise disturbs what happens and how the noise has to be taken out the other side and sense made of the message. And they, they grasped that completely. And I, I was very, very lucky to spend some time looking through some of their, their, their belongings in the Library of Congress. And it was just stunning to see the kinds of material they were reading and, and that fearlessness and kind of grasping really, really complex ideas of the times and kind of working with them. 
And the way I would say it, so as I said, th this might not mean things to some people here, other people here will come from this background, but they managed to explain ideas of interference, forward error correction, redundancy, transceiver sensitivity, diversity, directional antennas in that film. The film's available online and really, really worth, it's very, very old fashioned in one way and hugely modern in another way. And it was just amazing that they were able to take these really, really difficult concepts and kind of make them understandable. Um, this is one of the clips from the film, which is one of my favorite scene, and I use this a lot in things. And this is actually describing how, this is actually describing the idea of receiver sensitivity, that we all interpret things in different ways, and if you want a communication system to work, it's not gonna work if everyone sees something different coming out of it. So they had fantastic insight. So the overall message for me from this, though, is a very kind of profound message, and that message is, that this film was not kind of an education and outreach activity. So in the world I come from, a lot of the time when you talk about artists and designers coming on board, it's kind of lumped in under, let's do some education and outreach activity so the wider public can understand. And that is a fantastic thing to do, but that to me is not the only place that the art and design should be side by side with the technology. And what this film was, and I think is really, really important, this film was a taking of ideas, a really deep understanding of them, a recasting of these ideas, an expression of these ideas in, in different vocabulary, a provision of new ways of seeing, and what I feel very importantly, dealing with ambiguity. And when you look at the film, and I hope you get a chance to look at it, as artists, and I think they really embraced ambiguity in a way that engineers often can't. And through this embracing of ambiguity, I think the film stands on its own in 2015, despite being made in 1953. And what I mean by that is when you look at it, you begin to see modern ideas, and these ideas are ideas in communications that are actually embedded in this film and very, very much part of what they saw and what they understood at the time. So there's things about complex social networks because they kind of understood that a network was connected with people long before people were using mobile phones. And if you look at some of the images in the film, you see cities and you see swarms of people and they're understanding that that is a network. Very, very, the way we kind of currently do now through social media. You see all sorts of kind of beautiful ideas in there that means that they've understood that when you want to communicate, that you sometimes need to reinforce that through multiple different channels of communication. So you might speak it, you might put it, you know, sign it, and that, that's called kind of a reinforcement or diversity, and that's led to what we call these MIMO antenna techniques that we have today. And they understood that devices and things could get cleverer. And, and, and it's a I think it's a fantastic thing that you can produce a piece of footage in 1953 and it still have meaning in the world that we live in today. And I think you wouldn't get that, I certainly, if it, if it was me producing something um, as an engineer. So I want to relate it back a little bit to where I come from now. So I work in a, a, a national uh, telecommunications research center. It's one of the SFI centers. Um, and we focus on anything to do with future networks and communications. And I have been trying over the last while to embrace these kind of wider ideas. So what we're trying to do is we try to take the typical tools that we adopt, like mathematical analysis or modeling or simulation, and side by side adopt creative practices, whether visual, textual, or performance and work on those together. And one of the people who hugely inspires me, her name is Jessica Foley, she's uh, one of the artists I work with who hugely leads this. And she's completely changed my way of thinking, I have to say, uh, and, and, and the way I see pure technical stuff now. And one of the things that she introduced to me is this notion of epistemic injustice and this whole idea that we privilege certain knowledge over other knowledge. And we do it because it's just become normal. I, as an engineer, I assume that, oh, this is the logical answer to something. This is the right way of doing things. And it's really fantastic to have somebody here and to have groups of people to work with who kind of challenge that. But the reality is, is that this what happens, is that the vast majority of what we do is the traditional stuff, and the other stuff is kind of dwarfed at the side. It's something extra, it's something that we're lucky to be able to kind of sneak in around the edges. It's not core to what we do yet. And basically, for me, that's just currently not good enough. So what I want to do in the last few minutes of this talk is I want to explain to you why I think this is not good enough and why I think things have to change um, and why kind of the aims have kind of helped me with that mindset. So to do that, I just want to talk about one area in technology called the Internet of Things. 
So this is a huge buzzword at the moment, and there's going to be a panel on this later. So are there many people here who know what the Internet of Things are? So, so there's, there's a good, good lot of people, so, but I'll just explain it really briefly. So the Internet of Things world is all about taking everything in the world and instrumenting it in a way that it can report back to the Internet something about its condition or its context. And then you can use that information to actually make some kind of informed decision. So you hear people talking about the Internet of Things in all sorts of different ways, in smart cities, smart factories, smart food and agriculture. And I'll give you just a very, very few small examples. So for example, in Dublin here, you know the bus timetable, the automatic bus timetables that exist? That's like a very simple Internet of Things example. So the bus tells the internet where it is, rather than you're using a, pi a paper timetable. And because that's more dynamic, you can s save time, you don't need to go to the bus stop when a bus isn't coming, etc., etc. You hear people talking about smart parking, where the parking spaces can report where they're empty or full. Uh, cars are not going around aimlessly looking for parking spaces. There's less congestion. The city is more pleasant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's the way uh, the Internet of Things world is kind of conceived. So I was at an event about the Internet of Things this week, and I saw people give a certain number of demonstrations of ideas they had for the future. And the reality is with the Internet of Things that social rules are getting embedded in the environment around us. And those social rules will, yes, inform our decisions, but can also determine our behaviour. And in a lot of the examples I saw, I saw the very, very typical, you know, worn-out gender stereotypes reinforced in, in what was built into this universe around us. So the particular examples I saw were kind of, you know, targeting dynamic advertising where when you walked over to a particular spot, an advert was put your way and you would just not believe the cliches of cliches type of adverts that you're a woman, you must be interested in homemaking, you're a man, you're interested in adventure. I, I was just stunned at the level of it. But the reality for me is that this would not happen so these guys who were working on it were genuinely sincere people who were excited about the technology and working hard and completely oblivious of the wider environment that it was in. And in my opinion, this would not happen if there was that kind of artistic input, not because artists make beautiful pictures of things or come up with great application ideas, but I think core to the art and artistic and you know, creative practices mindset is understanding power, understanding culture, understanding power relationships, understanding that there is absolutely no such thing as neutral design. And when we as engineers design the world around us, we design a relationship and a power relationship in there. And that absolute truth is something that needs to be challenged. And it increasingly needs to be challenged in the very sophisticated, kind of dynamic, technical world that we're going into. So I would go as far as saying we're in a situation where this mixing of kind of people from different disciplines is not nice to have, but absolutely essential in kind of the world that we're facing into. There's fantastic, exciting opportunities in technology, and those exciting opportunities, from my perspective, have to be embraced with that kind of very diverse uh, mindset, with the ambiguity that kind of the artistic mindset brings, uh, with the challenging of power, and, and the kind of understanding, as I said, that there's no such thing as neutral design. So I'd like to end um, just on, 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 on a very small few comments. And um, I'm, I suppose I'm in danger of making a statement that I would call as conscious bias now. I think we're, we're in a world where if you look at technology challenges and if you look at everything that's happening, there is no way to solve those without taking that interdisciplinary, multimodal, you know, taking on all sorts of different ideas and bringing them together. And I think that actually women are exceptionally good at doing that. And I would say we're in a position, I can see it in myself in academia, that it's the, it's the kind of natural, uh, kind of, a lot of the time people are naturally drawn to this kind of bigger picture in this kind of interdisciplinary space. And I very much think that's a really, really, we're at a really exciting time in the world where we can actually do this and we can actually, the world is our oyster and kind of, I suppose, taking these places and kind of doing amazing things with them. I think this Inspire Fest just summarizes that. And as I said earlier on, Anne started out at the beginning uh, uh, yesterday, talking about like, give it a chance that you hear different things that are in, that you know may not on the face of be connected, but hugely, hugely resonate. And I think that's very, very much about what this this festival does. It's very, very much I think about the, what women can bring to, to as well as specific uh, uh, technological knowledge. And I think, um, as I said, the world is our oyster. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.